Hello. Is it Kia Ora? Is that right? Oh, I, I, I'm hesitant. I'm sorry. We Americans can't pronounce anything. Even our own language we don't really do very well with. Although better than you, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but at least we finish the word and don't shorten everything. But hello. Um, thank you so much for your hospitality and warm welcome. After watching how you all needle each other with whatever it is, tall poppy syndrome, sarcasm, and call it love, I'm very grateful that... <laughs> I experienced the American form of love, or the, the Jesus, like actual love, not that <laughs> love. But uh, no, seriously, thank you. It was an easy yes to come down. This is a little cheesy, but I have wanted to visit your country since I was, I think I was 12 years old. My son's with me, he's 13. And uh, I remember like, it was back in the like slideshow days when somebody would come back from a trip. This is really dating myself. And, and they would have like a slideshow of the trip. And I remember a family friend who just got back from New Zealand and it was just, pre-Lord of the Rings, before you were famous all over the world for your beauty. It was just sheep and mountains, and I just think, I want to go there someday. So it took me a few decades, but here I am. And I'm so happy, honestly, my, fame, my like kind of driving passion, we'll talk later in the day a little bit about some of my autobiography, but really got to my early 30s after um, my whole life in the church, my dad's a pastor and all of that, and really felt stuck in my apprenticeship, as I would say, to Jesus of Nazareth, and really in my spiritual formation, which is language we'll define in a bit. And, uh, and so it's been really a journey for me into how do we actually change to become more like Jesus, and in doing so, our real, true self. So I don't have all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but I feel like I'm asking some good questions, and I think you are too. And so let's just go on that journey together. I'll share what I have to learn and to offer, and then hopefully you do the same. Um, if you have a Bible, please turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Our morning session is very simple and straight down the middle. Um, most of the kind of key stuff I have to offer is this afternoon, so don't overeat at lunch. Um, but this morning, let me just kind of frame up for you this concept of apprenticeship to Jesus. You know, Jesus was a lot of things. Um, in our day and age, we often think of Jesus as the Son of God, which he was, or if you have spent time in the New Testament, we think of him as the Messiah or this long-awaited king of Israel and the world, and that's true as well. But if you were a first century Jew and you were just to rock up to synagogue one Saturday or Sabbath morning, and there was a guest rabbi in town to teach from whatever, the most likely category that you would have put Jesus in was that of a rabbi. Now, rabbi is just a Hebrew word meaning teacher, and a rabbi would travel around from city to city or village to village, um, from Sabbath to Sabbath, and he would teach from the Torah or the Jewish kind of writings of a vision of how to be human. He would offer what was called his yoke, which was his way of reading the Torah, his way of kind of being human in the world. And this is first and foremost most what Jesus was. Of the 90 or so times that people engage with Jesus in the four Gospels, over 60, 60 of those he's called rabbi or teacher. But tragically, this is a very simple idea that we've lost sight of in the West for all sorts of reasons, the kind of Protestant Catholic tension, I don't know if that's a big deal down here or not. Um, more recently, at least in my country, the liberal conservative rift between right and left where kind of the liberals took Jesus the teacher and the conservatives took Jesus the son of God and, and it, just, it was really messy in the divorce and really tragic. And so this is an idea that many of us need to recapture. of Jesus, first off, as smart, like I would argue is the most intelligent human being to ever walk the face of the earth, with a brilliant vision, not only of God, but of what it means to be human. And this is the beauty of Jesus, the God-man, as we would say in English, this divinity and humanity in the exact same place. In Jesus, we see not only what God is like, but we see a vision of what human beings have the potential to be like as well. So let's just read a story or two before we talk about it of Jesus the rabbi and uh, the apprentices in his wake. Mark chapter one, take a look at this well-known story, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. 
and I will send you out to fish for people. Now at once they left their nets and they followed him. We had gone a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them as well. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Turn the page, chapter 2, verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out to beside the lake. A large crowd came to him. And he began to teach them. He's a teacher. He's a rabbi. That's what he does. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Turn the page again. Chapter 3. Take a look at verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called... There's that language again. To him, those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name something or other, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who later betrayed him. One more, turn over to Mark chapter eight. Near the end, verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him. Pay attention to that, we'll come back to that. Along with his disciples. And he said, quote, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. The word life there is psuche in Greek, where we get the word psychology. It can also be translated soul. It's all of you. Whoever wants to save their soul will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Did you see a pattern in those stories? And that's just a sample set. There are many more. In story after story, the invitation of Jesus was not, hey, everybody, become a Christian or believe in me or believe the right things about God and the Bible and myself and what's about to happen in my death and resurrection. And in the meantime, just kind of wait for life after death and be a nice person and go to church. Instead, the invitation was come and follow me, or another way to translate that is come and be my disciple. Now, the word disciple in Hebrew is talmudim, and there are all sorts of ways to translate that. It can be translated, disciple is a fine translation. It's just not a word that's used in English anymore outside of the church, so it's a bit foreign, and often people import meanings into it. For example, at least in my country, normally it's used as a verb. It's never used as a verb one time in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, you don't disciple anybody any more than you Christian somebody or believer somebody. You either are, like people always ask me, who are you discipling? And I just want to quit back. Who are you Christianing, you know? Um, who are you believering or whatever? It's not a verb. It's a noun. It's not something you do. It's definitely not something that is done to you. It is something that you are. It is something where the onus of responsibility is not on a pastor or a mentor. It is actually on you as a disciple of Jesus. So disciple is a fine word. It's just not really used, and so we kind of make up meanings for it. Um, student is also a valid translation, but often then we think a kind of university system, like I have class with Jesus Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, from 10 to 10, 50 or whatever. Follower is also a valid translation, but now social media just ruined that for the world. <laughs> So I was like, I, follow, I love Jesus. I follow him on Instagram. He's great. Instagram stories, like doing things with spit and healing people. It's great. Um, whatever. But honestly, I think the best word, a number of scholars argue that the best word we have in the English language, which I think we both speak, almost, kind of, sort of, is this, that wasn't a slam. I mean, it's like we kind of speak the same language, but then you keep saying things, and I have no idea what you're saying, <laughs> you know? My goodness. But a number of scholars argue that the best word we have to capture the idea behind Talmudim, or the Greek translation of that as well, is this word apprentice. 
to follow a rabbi was to be an apprentice of a rabbi. Now, the hard truth, just to begin our time, is we might think of you know, apprenticeship or discipleship as a foreign kind of concept from the ancient world, not the modern one. But the reality is it's not at all. The hard truth is we are all disciples or apprentices or followers, whatever you want to call it, of somebody or something. The question is not, are you a disciple, but who or what are you a disciple of? Now in the West, in particular in your country and mine, where we have this myth of like the rugged individual out to sail across the world and what, ruin it, but that's a whole other thing. Um, We have this like kind of ethos, this celebration of the rugged individual. And we want so badly to believe that we are in charge of our own destiny. But it's just not true. As the poet said, no man is an island and neither is a woman. At some point in life, you have to chart a course or you just wander. And to do that, we need first off a vision of some kind of a destination. And that ironically, vision has to come from somebody else who's been there. And then we need either a map or even better, a guide who ideally has been there as well, or at least is further down the journey, to show us how to get from here to there, from birth to what we would call the good life. You need a community to journey along with. You need grace for that journey. And if your vision of what in both our countries we would call the good life, if it is good and beautiful and true, and if your map is accurate or your guide knows what he or she is doing, um, then you are good. You are en route to a life of human flourishing. But if your vision is at all off kilter, if what you think is good is not as good as you think, if what we think is beautiful is not as beautiful as we think, or true is actually a bit of truth with a bit of lie, or if your map is inaccurate, or your guide is not trustworthy, or maybe well-meaning but just off the mark, then in time, over the years and over the decades, we end up in trouble. To follow Jesus, or if you prefer, to apprentice under Jesus, is to take his teachings, again, he was a rabbi, his vision, of the good life as the vision of the good life. It's to take his map to his destination. It's to take, and I don't just mean heaven or hell, I mean to human flourishing, to take his presence as your guide, his community to the people to your right and to your left as those that you journey with and his grace for the journey. This is essentially what it means to be a disciple or an apprentice or a follower of Jesus. It's just to apprentice under Jesus into his vision of the good life. And just again to say it, You are all disciples of somebody or something. If you're here and you don't buy any of this, all of us, none of us have been where we want to go. So all of us work off a map to move forward into our vision of the good life. To follow Jesus is just to take Jesus' vision, his map, and his presence as our guide. Now, just to frame our time, to be an apprentice of a rabbi, both in the first century and for us in the 21st century, was a very simple endeavor. It was just to organize your life around three very simple goals. To be with Jesus for us, to become like Jesus, and to do what he did. Just a short word on each. First off, be with Jesus. So Jesus did not make up apprenticeship or discipleship. Many of us don't realize that. He was not the first rabbi to have disciples or the last. In fact, in the first century, discipleship was the apex of the Jewish education system, similar to our PhD or something like that, where three basic levels, there was the Beit Sefer or the house um, of learning, or I'm sorry, the house of the book, which was kind of our version of primary school or whatever you call it here, up till about age 11 or 12. You would memorize the entire Torah, Genesis, to Deuteronomy, put to memory, it's an oral culture, pre-codex, all of that. And then at that point, 90 plus percent of students were done. You would go home and you would join the family business, work on the farm, apprentice under your dad, mom, whatever. But then the best of the best moved on to a second level of education called Beit, um, 
Talmud, or the house, I'm sorry, Beit Sefer, the house of learning, which was actually a room or a little house built off the side of the synagogue where you would study under a full-time teacher, either a rabbi or a scribe, and you would memorize over the next three, four, five years of your life the entire, what we call the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, put to memory, right? So when Jesus or Paul, whoever quotes scripture right and left, don't like, that was a pre-Google world. They literally, and if they get it wrong once in a while, show them a little grace. Race, all right? Pre-Google, they had the entire Old Testament put to memory. Then again, at that point, you're 15, you're 16 years old, the vast majority went back to the family business. But the best of the best of the best, I don't know what you call it here, we'd say summa cum laude or the Rhodes Scholar or whatever, went on to this third level of education where you would apprentice under rabbi. Now this was really hard to get into. Again, this was the elite. You come from money, you have the right connections, you're brilliant, you have the student thing, all of that. And if you could get a rabbi to take you on, it was a really big deal. And at that point, you would follow, you would drop everything, drop the family business, all of that, and you would follow a rabbi. Now this wasn't a, a metaphor, or this wasn't a word picture, you would literally follow him as in you would walk behind him. You would go from village to village and from town to town, and your first goal was just to be with him. You were with him 24-7. You would sleep at his side, take your meals at his side, sit under his teaching all day long. In fact, he would walk with you. Class was open-air environment. As you would walk from village to village for his next teaching, you would walk at a slow pace right behind him, say 10, 12, however many apprentices, and um, you would just listen to him talk, listen to him teach the Torah, his yoke, and you would take that on. There was a first century blessing that just said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. This is from a pre-asphalt, or do you call it tarmac here? What do you, again, we almost speak the same language, whatever, pre-paved road, everything was dirt, and you would walk behind him, and by the end of the day, you were just covered in the dust of your rabbi, and this was a blessing in that day. Now, again, what does this mean for us two millennia later on the other side? I think somebody said that New Zealand's the farthest place in the world from Israel, is that right? It sounds cool, if not, either way, you're here and you follow Jesus. And you know, what does this mean for us? I mean, Jesus is not here in the flesh, how do we follow Jesus? Well, it's pretty basic math, and you know this, but you know now through Jesus' death and resurrection and the coming of the Spirit in Acts chapter two that we read of, now we all have access to Jesus through his Spirit. Jesus actually said this is better because when he was here in the flesh, he had to limit his like close circle to 12. There's a few more than 12 followers of Jesus in the world now. And I mean, that would be really miserable if you really needed to have coffee with Jesus and you had to book it out a few centuries in advance or whatever. But now we all have access to Jesus through the Spirit. This means that the first and primary goal of our apprenticeship to Jesus is to live in connection to and awareness of the Spirit all day long. This is it. The reality is that the Spirit of Jesus is always with us. Um, tragically, we're not always with him. We're often on our phone or in traffic or in the middle of email or staff meeting or class or whatever it is that you do kind of during the weeks. One of the reasons that church or days like today that are set aside are so important because we come back in our mind and our body to be with the God who is always with us. Our body is so often in a hurry as we move through the world. Often this means we just need to slow down and come back to the moment, because the moment is where we find God, not only in our mind, but in our soul. Now, whatever you wanna call this, Jesus called this way of life abiding, which is another word picture of a vineyard. I hear you have some lovely vineyards not far away. It's a, it's a beautiful word picture of this vine and this branch, and that's what life was with God for Jesus. St. Paul later called this prayer without ceasing, St. Teresa, if you're familiar with her work, she later called it contemplation, which is language still used today. Brother Lawrence, that Parisian monk from a few hundred years ago, called it the practice of the presence of God. I think that's one of my favorite names for it because it takes practice. A.W. Tozer called it constant conscious communion. And all of this comes as the natural byproduct of a mind that is set on God all through the day. 
I don't know if you've read this. Um, I've been savoring one of the, I have a few beds, a few books that I keep in my bedside table just to come back to on a regular basis. And one is, it's barely a book. It's I think 45 pages long. It's called Letters by a Modern Day Mystic by Frank Laubach. Anybody read that? He was an American missionary to the Philippines and quite a few, about a century ago to the Moros, which is a Muslim group in the Philippines, part of the silent billion at the time of people who could not read or write. He's the only missionary to ever make it onto a US postage stamp. Not that you care, but we think that's kind of a cool thing. And he's actually well known in academic circles and very well respected for his work around social justice and literacy. That's kind of what he's famous for in the secular world, but many people ignore the fact that work of social justice and literacy and his um, model of literacy is still used by millions of educational centers around the world decades after his life and work. But people often forget that grew out of a deeper life passion, which was what he called the practice of the presence of God. Early on, he called it his game with minutes. He would play this little game where he would just every single minute of the day, his goal was to just turn his mind to God for one second of one minute every single day. And like, think about it, that's an easy thing and it's the hardest thing in the world, right? And you can read his little book and it's just a collection of letters and they're just beautiful. Let me just read one excerpt to you. He writes this, perhaps a man who has been an ordained minister since 1914 ought to be ashamed to confess that he never before felt the joy of complete hourly, minute by minute, now, what do I even call this? More than surrender, I had that before. More than listening to God, I tried that before. I cannot find the word that will mean to you or me what I am now experiencing. It is a will act. I compel my mind to open straight out toward God. I wait and listen with determined sensitiveness. I fix my attention there and sometimes it requires a long time early in the morning to attain that mental state, but I determine not to get out of bed until that mindset, that concentration upon God is settled. It also requires determination to keep it there, for I feel as though the words and thoughts of others near me were constantly exerting a drag backward or sideways. For the most part recently, I've not lost sight of this purpose for long and I've soon come back to it. After a while, perhaps it will become a habit and the sense of effort will grow less. Later in his journey, a few years into this, he writes this, this concentration upon God is strenuous, but everything else has ceased to be so. I think more clearly, I forget less frequently. Things which I did with a strain before, I now do easily and with no effort whatever. I worry about nothing, I lose no sleep, I walk on air a good part of the time. Even the mirror reveals a new light in my eyes and face. I no longer feel in a hurry about anything. Each minute I meet calmly, nothing can go wrong excepting one thing, that is that God may slip from my mind. I read that excerpt to you, and I know that's a bit long, because I think that's an autobiographical experience of what Jesus has for all of his apprentices. And this is harder than it was in 1914. We have this little demonic being in our pocket called an iPhone, right? Which is quite helpful at times, but not in this. We have the busyness of life and you're in a city and there's noise and we're in this secular narrative that is just swimming in our mind all of the time. But this is the beginning point. Some of you, if you're new at all to Jesus and there's a lot to this whole thing and to millennia of tradition and you're thinking, where do I even start? Very simple, you start right here. You just slow your life down. You take out your schedule. You get a red pen and you just murder about 19 things, that's it. You just like, just get violent with your schedule. Or maybe you start with two. I'm a little bit over intense, I apologize. Start with two, kill two things out of your morning or your day routine or your week. You slow your mind and you just begin to set your mind on God. 
you know much about the monastic Christian, where fixed hour prayer comes from, where they would have seven set times during the day to come together for prayer. You'd read a psalm or a liturgy. It was just an attempt at this. It was just training wheels to a bicycle. Do you have training wheels to a bicycle? Do you have bicycles here? Yes. <laughs> um, I think we're at the edge of the world. Who knows, people, right? Um, but it's just mental training wheels. Call it neuroplasticity. Call it fixed hour prayer. Call it abiding. It was just they would pause seven times in a day to just come back to the moment and above all, come back to God and let it begin to become a habit in your mind. Let the way that God wired the neurobiology of your mind begin to reform into a mind that is set on God to where more and more, when you get a moment of quiet, you're at the stoplight, you get a break between email, you are walking out to your car, your mind just goes back to God, goes back to God, goes back to God. A.W. Tozer, one of the most famous mystics of the 20th century, writing from the busy city of Chicago in his day, said that as we set our heart's attention on Jesus, I like that language, he said this, a habit of soul is forming which will become after a while a sort of spiritual reflex requiring no more conscious effort on our part. So if you're new to the practice, it's like, okay, you set the alarm on your you know, Apple Watch or whatever, and it's like every hour, bang, bang, bang. you're like, think about God. Okay, what do I think about again? Okay, think, and it just, it feels awkward and it feels clumsy and it feels like an act of the will. But as you grow and as you mature into it over months, over years, over a lifetime, your mind just goes right to God. The second it has a moment, you wake up and the first thought in your mind will be God and you will begin just to live more and more from this connection to an awareness of the spirit of Jesus. Dallas Willard, who's the most important teacher outside of the New Testament in my journey with Jesus, has this wonderful kind of paragraph about the practice of the presence of God. And at the end, he writes, soon, after just a long time of practice, our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. I love that. I love that imagery. The needle of a compass just goes back to the north, goes back to the north. Your mind will begin to just go back to God, go back to God, go back to God. My point is that what all of these master teachers of the way of Jesus down through church history and going all the way back to the writings of the New Testament and of course Jesus himself, what they all attest to is that if you keep at this, your mind will reshape it will reform, your neural pathways will begin to set the heart's attention on God. The heart, of course, in biblical literature is this trifecta of your thought life, your emotions, and your will or your desire. It's what you think about, what you feel, and what you want. This core aspect of you, you could define that as your spirituality because all three of those things don't really work under a microscope. The mind in particular is one of the great mysteries of science, as I know just enough to be dangerous about science. But you can't take a mind, you can take a brain and you can, you can analyze that, you can't analyze a mind. So there's this spiritual part of you that the writers of the Bible call the heart. What you think about, what you feel, and what you want. The will is even more than the mind, impossible for scientists to track. This, this inner influx that is what separates human beings from the animals. It is, you could argue, the most important thing about you. Your will, your capacity, agency, your freedom to choose between one option or another. And this center of you, your heart, your thinking, your feeling, your desire, as you begin just to, through your mind, set it upon God, set it upon God, set, as you begin to see who God actually is as put on display through the love of Jesus, as you begin to notice the way that God is looking at you, as you begin to see the way that God is looking at you with love and compassion, with truth, but with overwhelming hospitality and welcome and a smile on his face. That is the beginning point. We'll talk this afternoon about how we change. That is the beginning and it is the baseline and you never move on from that. This is just the baseline of our apprenticeship to Jesus. Just a life with God all day long. And it's the best part. Like I like to quip that the best part about following Jesus is Jesus. 
And often we forget that. We think the best part is like, you know, meeting a girl at church or whatever it is. Or the best part is an answer to prayer or healing or the prophetic or life. From, and for me, the older I get, the more I think the, the, the second best part is the transformation of the soul into Christ's likeness. All of that is true. But the best of the best is just Jesus himself. Secondly, your goal as an apprentice of Jesus is to become like Jesus. Again, rewind to the first century. If you were an apprentice under a rabbi, you, this is millennia before the kind of hyper-individualism of the Western world. You wanted to be your rabbi. You would literally dress like him. You would copy not only his theology, his way of reading Torah. You would copy his tone of voice, his mannerisms. You would mimic him because you wanted to be him. Now, as apprentices of Jesus, our goal is the same. It is to become like our teacher and in doing so, become our real true self. Again, tragically, this needs to be said. Again, I don't know your country. I've been here half of a day. I love it. By the way, the rivalry between Australia and New Zealand, you win, hands down. Just, <laughs> you win. Um, but uh, what can I say? I'm 12 hours in. Maybe I just, it's just the best parts or something. I don't know. Um, but this tragically needs to be said. There's this gross, heretical, at least in my country, kind of take that the point is just to kind of have a relationship with Jesus and go to the right place where you die. What a tragedy that the transformation of the soul is not front and center for many followers of Jesus. You know, philosophers argue that there are three great questions in life. Who is God? Who are we? And what is the good life? Obviously, the secular narrative has a radically different answer to all three of those questions. Who is God? There is none. He, she, it is a myth from a pre-scientific age. Now we know better. We have a microscope. Who are we? We're animals with time and chance on our side. What is the good life? Well, since there is no meaning or purpose to life, all of this is just an accident. So basically it's pleasure or happiness, depending on who you talk. Just feel as good as you can for as long as you can until you die, unless the Silicon Valley gets its act together and we can upload our consciousness to the internet and live forever, right? Which is what half of my country thinks is going to happen. It's just nonsense. It's religion. It's a bad religion. It's a worldview. Those are answers to the questions from the secular perspective. Jesus has very different answers to who are you, who is God, what is the good life. To apprentice under Jesus is to place your trust. The word is usually translated believe in the New Testament. When Jesus says repent and believe in the gospel, um, again, we almost speak the same language. Believe in American, for most people, means say yes in your mind to, and that's great. But the bigger idea behind that Greek word is to place your trust in. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not I believe that the sun is X number of miles away from the earth or whatever. To believe is when you get on an airplane, that's trust, not belief. Like you trust that it will take you where you want to go and hopefully you won't die along the way. And you actually place the weight of your life into that metal tube and somebody you can't even see behind a door that is now locked, right? And you place your trust in it to go where you want to go. This is what it means to believe or to trust. To apprentice under Jesus is to believe or to trust in his answers to those human questions. Who is God? Who are we? What is the good life? It is to let his vision of God, his vision of humanity, and his vision of the good life shape your own. This is why if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, what is the temptation in the garden? It is a temptation to doubt the goodness of God and to redefine good and evil based not on the voice of God, but based on the voice in the ear personified by the serpent and the desire of your own heart. That is the human condition. Fast forward however many millennia to where we are now, it's still the exact same temptation on repeat. Don't trust what God has said about his love and goodness toward you and don't trust his definition of good and evil and human flourishing, whether it's about money or sex or power or whatever it is for you. Rather, trust the voice in your head and the desire of your heart. This is where the rubber meets the rose, why Jesus would constantly call people to repent, which is a word that can be translated rethink, rethink your worldview and believe. Place your trust in Jesus' teachings. Again, he was a teacher in his vision of reality. 
And this is really what it means to apprentice under him. You know, there's a progression in our spiritual formation. We'll define that word this afternoon. It just means how we're formed from the inside out. There's a progression from believe to become to behave. Put another way, what we believe or, or the stories that we trust in our mind or the ideas that we trust in our mind shapes the person we become, right? We live into that through habit. Habit has this effect on our, the fiber of our being, which in turn shapes how we behave. We just naturally live less out of willpower and more out of habit and character. You know, I hear people rail against behavior modification and moralism all the time, and I get that, but, and maybe this is just because I'm in a hyper-progressive, very non-Christian city, um, but I'm pretty sure that Jesus wants to modify my behavior, at least. I know there's quite a bit of it that I would like to modify because it's not in line with the Sermon on the Mount. There's just a little bit of discrepancy in my life between Matthew 6 and 7 and my own day-to-day life. Not much, just a tiny bit, you know, just, just a scotch, and I'm pretty sure that, I mean, morality is about human flourishing. It's about good and evil. It's about what is the good life. So to beat up on behavior modification or moralism is a a tragic, I think, misreading of what Jesus is on about. But what's right about that and why people have a gut reaction, particularly people who grew up in a legalistic or kind of hyper-conservative wing of the church, what's right about that is Jesus is after more than behavior modification. He's at the core of who you are. Like, again, your heart, what you think about, what you feel, and even what you want. He's at the core of the truth or the lies that we place our trust in and believe and live from who we become. He's after the spiritual formation of our core because the heart, everything comes from the heart. And the dream is that as we apprentice under Jesus, as we hear his vision of the good life, of good, evil, beautiful, true, what is it? As we place our trust in it, as we index our heart, our thinking, our feeling, or even our desire, toward him and his vision, that we begin to change from the inside out into the kind of people who just over time are naturally like him, the kind of people for whom it would be easier to trust in God than to stress out. It would be easier to move slowly through our day in calm gratitude than to live in this hurry and this stress and this chaos. It would be easier just to say thank you and enjoy what we have than to live from greed. It would be easier to celebrate the success and life and flourishing of a friend or a competitor or a colleague than it would be to give in to the envy of the human heart. It would be easier to love our enemy than to do violence toward them or even gossip about them. It would be easier to celebrate than to criticize, to rejoice than to be sad. This to love than to hate. This this is the kind of person that we want to become through our apprenticeship to Jesus. You know, and it's really the most important thing. We'll talk again all afternoon about this. But Dallas Willard used to say that the most important thing that Jesus gets out of your life and that you get out of your life is the person you become through your apprenticeship to Jesus. And this is what you will carry with you into eternity. And this is the heart of an apprentice of Jesus, just this relentless, ruthless desire to change, grow, mature through the grace and love of God, to become more like Jesus. Because in our worldview, and this is radically different than the secular worldview that we live in and we experience through our phone feed every single day, which is out of a capitalistic system that wants to commoditize, that wants to monetize everything and everybody and wants to make money off of your disorder, desire, your sin, your human condition, your angst, your lack of fulfillment, your lack of meaning, just wants to monetize all of that. And so it constantly screams to us that the good life or happiness is the result of circumstances, right? If you just get the right economic level, you get the right salary, you get the right job, you get the right body, you get the right partner, you get the right fame, you get whatever it is for you, surf that morning, whatever it is for you, that's how you achieve the happy life. And then if if that's your working theory of how to live a happy life, life just becomes, you realize this as you hit, I don't know, near 30 or so, that life is just one giant game of whack-a-mole, you know what I mean? Like you fix one problem, you're like, if I just get this fixed, if I just get graduated from college and get a good job, it's like you, you whack that mole, and then it's like another one comes up. Well, okay, if I just fix this one, boom, and it's another one. And then all of a sudden you realize this just doesn't stop. I was just whack-a-mole. It's just over and over and over again. Rohr says that we try to change our circumstances to avoid changing our character. 
right? Because we think that's the way to manipulate the external circumstances of our life is the route to happiness, where we just play into the propaganda of advertising that just wants to sell us another thing, give us a new identity that's external, not internal, that we achieve rather than we discover. Jesus would say that a better route to achieve, I don't think he would use the word happiness, he would use the word joy or something like that, is to become the kind of person who is happy no matter what the circumstances are of your life, for whom life, I think is the word Jesus would use, is the result of communion with God and your character that comes over years of life with him. To become the person who has by nature the inner disposition of peace, as of Jesus, as laid out in Galatians, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness. And, you know, counter to what many people think, as we become more like Jesus, we don't become clones. Like, that's, that's the fear of every Western. What if I'm like everybody else? <gasps> the horror of it, right? But actually, we become more our real, true, best self. The irony of Western society is that for all of our focus on individualism, sin makes people the same. Like, if you, like, just set aside like everything, gender, socioeconomic class, ethnic background, worldview, education, religion, just set all of that aside and you devolve human beings to desire, specifically what the writers in your testament call the flesh, your desires that are bent in the wrong direction, you really come up with a pretty short list, hence the Ten Commandments. I mean, seriously. Think about it. There's, you come up with a, the Ten Commandments, people often exalt as this moral. It's like baseline morality. Don't murder. <laughs> right? Jesus takes it a little bit farther than don't kill people, you know? Don't have an affair. Like, it's, it's baseline morality. Don't lie. Baseline morality. You devolve, and it's ironic. When people are run by desire... When people are, in the language of the New Testament, in slavery to desire, which is ironically what the Western world has redefined and called freedom, the freedom to do whatever you want, which is shocking because that is literally what the New Testament calls slavery, then you devolve to this baseline, what the New Testament calls the flesh. It's this animalistic, primal part of who you are for lust, for sex, for greed, for, self, for instant gratification, for power over others, for the ability to do whatever the heck you want and nobody to tell you different. But if you follow Jesus and you die to yourself, right? And you let those desires, the ones, not the healthy ones that are from Jesus, but the bent ones, you put them to death, you set them aside, you ironically are set free from the need to posture and perform to fit a stereotype in order to achieve and experience love. You realize I am loved. The mess that I am right now, I'm loved. I won't be more loved when I get my act more together. I will be loved then, I'm loved now. And then you are actually free to explore the full range of your personhood, the good, the bad, the ugly, to meet the reality of who you actually are in the safe place of the Father's love and compassion, to begin the slow journey to move forward in Christ-likeness. And then you're actually set free to be who you are. The most individualistic people I know are all like really old followers of Jesus. None of them dress cool because they don't care anymore, you know? And it's not just because it's because there, there is a uniqueness, there is an individuality, there is a freedom that comes from the people who die to self, follow Jesus, and ironically become the person that God had in mind before they were in their mother's womb. M. Scott Peck says it this way, if ever one has the good fortune to meet a living saint, one will have met somebody absolutely unique. Though their visions may be remarkably similar, the personhood of saints is remarkably different. This is because they have become utterly themselves. God creates each soul differently so that when all the mud is finally cleaned away, his light will shine through it in a beautiful, colorful, totally new pattern. Finally, goal one is to be with Jesus. Out of that, goal two is to become like Jesus. And finally, goal three is then in time to do what he did. Or really a better way to say that is, you know, to do what he would do if he were me. Um, did you have the 90s phenomenon of the WWJD bracelet? Did that hit over here? Fantastic. See, we share a lot. We share more in common than we want to admit, right? And that's kind
kind of a great question, but it's kind of not all that helpful. You know what I mean? Like, what would Jesus do if you're like a young mom and you're breastfeeding? How would, <laughs> what does Jesus say about breastfeeding? Is he natural birth, water birth, epidural? No. What would he say? Like, he doesn't say anything about that. I'm sorry. He was a man and he would, didn't even have a wife, much less a child, right? So a more helpful question is what would Jesus do if he were me? What if he was a 17-year-old girl who was a student? We, what do you call it? We call it high school in school, whatever. What would he do if he were a 69-year-old widower? If he was the executive at a company, if he was a barista at your local coffee shop, if he had no idea what he was supposed to do with his life, what, how would Jesus live if he had your personality, your Myers-Briggs type, your Enneagram number, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your family of origin, your ethnicity, your national history. How would Jesus live if he were me? That is the driving question of an apprentice of Jesus. Because you think about, that's why I like this word apprenticeship. And as Newt said earlier, if you're an apprentice, like we still have, the only place that we use the word apprentice really in American culture is for the trades, all apprentice. So an, I don't know if you would say that here, but an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter or sometimes in the arts, you would apprentice under a master art, any kind of craftsman or craftswoman. So like there's a guy in our church right now who's a volunteer who's an apprentice to become a plumber. It's a four-year program. And, you, and his goal at the end of four years is not just to like answer the plumbing test like with 100% A++ and know all about plumbing. His goal is to plumb, a, I don't know if plumb's a verb, but Okay, it is now to plumb a house, right? To get a job as a plumber and do the work of his master teacher. And in the same way, and this is what I love about the vineyard movement and kind of the charismatic movement that we have been just learning from so much over the last five years, is there's this recognition that Jesus does all that he does, not just teaching, but healing the sick and prophecy and social justice and all of it, political advocacy, everything. He does it not just because he's God, he is, but he does it empowered by the spirit of Jesus. And we now have the same spirit where Jesus says at the end of the Gospel of John, like, you'll do greater things than these. Now, there's lots of debate and controversy about what the heck does Jesus mean there by like greater than raising the dead, greater than feeding five. I don't know exactly. Is it quality? Is it quantity? I don't know exactly what he means by greater, but I know he doesn't mean lesser. Whatever it means, it doesn't mean lesser. Whatever greater means, it, it doesn't mean lesser. So like this Jesus mindset, no, he will go to the Father, which he said is better, The Spirit will come, so one, now we all have access to the Father's love, and that same Spirit will empower you to do what Jesus did, which means you read a story about Jesus healing the sick, your goal as an apprentice of Jesus is to grow and mature in the power of the Spirit to where you heal the sick, you prophesy, you do your work, whether it's as a rabbi, or a professor, or a full-time parent, or a barista, or an architect, or an engineer, or whatever it is that you do with your life. This is the driving framework of Jesus, where there is no divide between sacred and secular, between your job and your discipleship and your life and your community. All of it is under this rubric, whether you're an engineer or a parent, whether you're a day off or your vacation or you're at the office, all of it is under this rubric of I follow Jesus. What would he do if he were me? And I love that that's a question with an open answer to it, right? There's no, there's no test. There's no, it's, sometimes there's not even right or wrong. There's just the question. It's not about the answer. It's about living the question. I think about some of the great questions of our day, whether it be around racial injustice or colonization or around the role of money in society or political theory. Sometimes we just have to live the questions. It's less about the right answer. It's what would Jesus do if he were me? And we act out with this creative freedom that God put in us, his call on our lives. So be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what he would do if he were me. Now, this is what back home we call practicing the way of Jesus. And I love this language of the way. It's used all through the Gospels. It's not used much in the Western church anymore. And I love this picture because the way of Jesus is exactly that. It is a way of life. 
It's not just a set of ideas that we believe in our head or what we would call Bible and theology. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts, what we would call ethics. It is both of those things, but it's more, not less. It is a lifestyle based on that of Jesus of Nazareth. This is why the four gospels come to us as first century biographies. Any biography readers in the house? You know who you are. It takes a special kind of person to give 800 pages to a dead person, you know? Um, I'm not an avid biography reader. I dabble. Every, basically once a year on vacation, I read a few. So this last year, I read Elon Musk and Martin Luther by Metaxas and another one. So it's, it's, I, but think about biographies. Why do most of us read biographies? Usually, we read a biography of a luminary. It's rare to read a biography of like Bob. You know what I mean? Normally, it's some, it's Steve Jobs, or it's Benjamin Franklin, or it's, I don't know who would be really cool down here, forgive my lack of cultural awareness, but um, whoever it is, we read about some luminary, some man, some woman who was a bright thinker, an incredible leader who changed the world because we want to be like them, or in some of their cases, we don't want to be like them at all, and we want to either copy or avoid at whatever cost that kind of a life. And so when you read a biography, at least the way most of us, is you read a detail about the life of said luminary, and you often think, how could I incorporate that detail into my life? So a hero of mine is Dallas Willard. I read his biography this last summer on vacation. Sorry, it's winter where I'm from. It's, it's confusing, I know. Last winter, for, I don't know, whatever, forget that. My last summer. And, um, and just, he's a hero of mine, and just reading about how he would wake up every morning, and before he would let himself get out of bed, he would lie there, often with Psalm 23, and he would just set his mind on God, and he would just sit in the love and compassion of God, and he would wait until his heart was just set in attention and awareness on the love of God before he would ever get out of bed. So I read that, and I don't just think, wow, cool. I think, okay, I know what I'm doing in the morning, right? Because I want to become like him. I want to be transformed to become more like Jesus, ultimately, but I don't mind being like Dallas Willard either. And so I then copy that detail into my morning routine. I've, this has been a, few, a year now, and I'm still in this place. I love it. I can't think of a better way now to begin each morning. My point is, this is how you read biographies. Tragically, very few of us read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this way. Notice that we'll talk all afternoon about the role of the practices or the spiritual disciplines. With a few exceptions, they are never commanded. Jesus does not command you to have a quiet time in the morning. He doesn't command you to read the Bible at all, much less read through the Bible in a year or Lectio Divina or whatever your style is. He doesn't command you to go to church on Sunday. He just does all of these things and then says, come, apprentice under me. That's how it works. Like maybe you could argue he commands you to pray. That's about the one thing. Other than that, you just read Jesus got up early in the morning. He went off to a solitary place and there he prayed. Jesus was in the synagogue, quote, as was his custom one Sabbath morning. And then Jesus would just regularly say, come, follow me. Come, apprentice under me. Another way to translate that is come, copy the details of my life. And this is what all of the practices or the spiritual disciplines are. They are just attempts to copy the details of Jesus' morning routine, his weekend routine, his day-to-day, his lifestyle, to add not just theology, not just ethics, but his lifestyle, which is really where the money's at, to add all of that into your life with the result that all of the practices, every last one, whatever your list is, silence and solitude, Sabbath, prayer, fasting, church, all of it, worship by singing, all of it, the end goal is just to make space for God, to set your mind and your body, not just your mind, all of you, before the spirit and the truth of God because it's by spirit and by truth that we are transformed from the heart out. St. John of the Cross, a Spanish mystic that I've been reading a lot the last few years, writes this, the spiritual life is about making space for God in our lives, a space for God to fill because his greatest desire is to give himself completely to us. 
Everything that we'll talk about this afternoon, the practice of spiritual formation, how we change. We'll talk a lot about our part and our responsibility before God. We'll talk about that later. It's kind of the most important thing I have to say today. But do not miss the why behind all of it. Where people get off with the spiritual disciplines, with spiritual formation, is when they forget the why. All of this is about making space for God to love us. There is a discipline, hence the name, and even a duty to them. But the motivation is loving relationship. Because in the post-sexual revolution kind of Western world, love has been redefined as an emotion rather than a virtue. This is hard for many of us to get our head around. We think that to do something out of duty is bad. It's not. It's actually healthy maturity. But love is often manifested as the discipline and duty to make space for relationship. Every Friday morning, my wife and I go out for brunch. I have Fridays off. Our kids are in school. Every Friday morning. There are times when I really want to. There are other times when I'd rather do something else. But it isn't, don't tell her that, please. (laughs) She's not here, and I'm sure she does not feel that way about me at all, ever. Uh, All of you single people are like, how could you dare say that? All the married people are like, yeah, of course, naturally. (laughs) But there is a duty to it, a discipline even to it. Don't get me wrong, most of the time I, I really enjoy it. But there's a duty, and then you're like, who is this guy? Uh, There's a duty and a discipline to it that is an expression of my love for her. Same with my children, same with my best friends. You know, my best friend just had a baby, and I'm going to pay out of my pocket to fly down to San Francisco and see his baby. I don't really want to spend $400. I'll see her in March at this thing we're both going to be at. But it's an act of duty, basically. But... It's the right thing to do. But I'm not doing it out of guilt trip or obligation. I'm doing it because this is my best friend, and I love him. I love him. And I want to be there, not two months after her birth, but two weeks after her birth, just for four hours, just to give them a hug and say, that's love. That's what you do. Through duty and discipline, you make space for loving relationship. Our relationship with Jesus is no different. We get out what we put in. We have to carve out time. This is why I think the number one thing, we'll talk about this tomorrow, any of you around at that church gathering, is we have to slow our life down. This is not, this can't be more on top of an already over busy life. This has to be less. We have to make space for the relationship of love because everything, back to that first goal, be with Jesus, that is the baseline for everything out of which we change. If you want to take some time later on today, just go read Galatians chapter five, that famous passage on the fruit of the spirit that is often bent out of shape into a list of commands to be more virtuous. So often people read that list and think, I need to be more loving. I need to be more joyful. I need to be more, oh, I'm so stressed out. I need to be more peaceful. I'm so like impatient with my children. I need to, okay, be more patient, be more. They're not commands. You can't even command them if you want because many of them are emotional dispositions. You know what I mean? You can like command to act loving, but you can't command like, to like somebody, like there's no switch in you to like, I'm really, sa- I'm really sad right now. Okay, be happy, switch, done, great, right? If there was, like entire industries of medicine and therapy would just go out of business, right? There's no switch. These are not commands. There is one command that Paul repeats three, that's at Galatians 5, is Paul's exegesis of John chapter 15, on, Jesus teaching on abiding. And mo- there's all sorts of allusions in there. And there's one command, he repeats it not once, not twice, but three times, and it is to, quote, walk in the Spirit. That's Paul for Jesus, abide in the vine. As you just set your mind on God, put your thoughts, your feelings, your desire on God, notice how God is loving you, and live from that posture of awareness to and connection to God. What happens is Jesus does the work of transformation and you, over time, it doesn't happen like this, you become more and more loving, more and more joyful, more and more at peace, more and more at patient, and on down the list. This is what Jesus has for you, which means your main responsibility in all of this is just to set yourself before God as often as you can every single day. It's just to make space. We have a responsibility to make space for God to love us and transform us for the inside out.
So this is my best just take or frame of reference for what it means to apprentice under Jesus. That if you're new to this, five years from now, 10 years from now, down the road, one, you experience more and more life with Jesus. You just find that your mind just is in the presence of God more and more. Two, that you become more like Jesus. You are transformed to become a more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient kind of soul. And three, that you just begin to do the kinds of things that Jesus would do if he were you and to play your small part in the world. In closing, just notice one last thing, that again, the invitation of Jesus is to become an apprentice, not a Christian. You know, I'm guessing you know this, but the word Christian is never used by Jesus once. Christianity is not used at all in the New Testament. The word Christian is used two or three times in the New Testament by outsiders, not insiders, as an insult that later, post-New Testament, people began to kind of take on and own. Like in the way you do, people just mock you for something all the time. You can't beat them. You just, yeah, that's right. That's what I am kind of thing. But the word that's used not two times, but 268 times by Jesus, the writers of the four gospels, the writers of the New Testament is that word in Greek, it's mathetes, or disciple, or apprentice. This is Jesus' primary identity. The second one is a Delphoi, or brothers, sisters, family. First, we're apprentices of Jesus, and a close second is we're family. This is the language of Jesus. Now, what's the difference in the English language between Christian and disciple? Again, I'm reading some of my own context into yours, and forgive me for that. But in my country, all the word Christian means, I mean, you read that like 80 plus percent of our country is Christian, and then you read about our politics, and you're like, wait a minute, 80% of that country is not following Jesus, right? You read that Donald Trump's a Christian, and you're like, wait a minute, be with, I don't think the driving principles of his life are be with Jesus, become like Jesus, <laughs> and do what he would do if he was president of the United States. I, don't think that's even on his radar, right? There's a voting block over there that likes the word Christian. All right, we'll play to that, you know? My point is, um, in my country, we've created a cultural milieu where you can be a Christian but not an apprentice of Jesus. And that, for most people in my country, just means you, you're theistic, you believe in God, you have a quasi-orthodox view of Christianity, the religion that's grown up around Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and teaching, some of it wonderful, some of it not. And um, you go to church once in a while and you're a quasi-moral person. I don't even know what that means anymore. This, um, this is not what Jesus is after. Jesus is not after converts to Christianity but apprentices into his kingdom vision of life. And this category of Christian is just nowhere to be found in Jesus' mind. You read the four gospels. We read one example in Mark 8. There are two categories, not three. There's the crowds and there's the apprentices of Jesus. And the crowds are really ambiguous. You have no idea who's there. Jew, Gentile, Torah observant, not Torah observant, there for the right reasons, there for a free lunch. You have no clue who they are, what the motivation is, and that's on purpose. It's not to shame them, they're not bad, they're just this, the crowds are anybody, the crowds are everybody. And the invitation is always for the crowds to become apprentices of Jesus. What that means for many in the West is that the invitation is for Christians to become followers of Jesus. Right, this was, you could argue, the greatest issue facing our world today. And of course, this will cost all of us, we'll talk more about that this afternoon. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, writing under Nazi Germany, coined that famous phrase, the cost of discipleship, based on what we read in Mark 8. Come, deny yourself, take up your cross. Meaning there's, this life begins with death. Saying yes to Jesus begins with saying no to all the other teachers and visions of the good life on offer. And he said, man, he was beating up on the, what he called cheap grace, which in his time was on the right, not on the left, and gave rise to the church's baptism of Nazism. And he was just an advocate against that. But many since him have rightly pointed out, yes, we have to talk about the cost of discipleship, but we also have to talk about the cost of non-discipleship. It will cost you to follow Jesus. It will cost you even more not to follow Jesus. In Jesus' own language, it will cost you your soul, your psuche, your psyche, the life that you crave. No matter what it is that does not go by the name of Jesus, it's never worth it. So again, this morning, very simple. More to say this afternoon. But this is what it means to apprentice Jesus, to be with him, to become like him, to do what he did, to experience his love by just making space for relationship 
whether that means a death to busyness, a death to sin, a death to our individualism, a death to our antonymian kind of don't tell me what to do. We set this death because we believe on the other side of death is resurrection. And we believe that as we lose our life or our soul, we gain it. Let's stand together and just pray. Would you just take a deep breath? And uh, I've said a lot. Let's just have a moment just to wait on God. See what he would have for us before our break. Spirit, come. May you just experience the love of God. May you notice how God is noticing you right now. Sit in his love and his joy and his peace. not in a rush, just take your time. Before we end, um, I just would love to pray a little bit. If there's anyone in the room, and I don't know if there's one of you or 50 of you, and you've maybe grown up in the church or been in it for a while, and your experience has been a little bit more of the religion of Christianity than the way of Jesus, and a little bit more of the behavior modification and moralism than the transformation by love and joy and peace, I just sense that there's some for whom hurt, some kind of an emotional or relational wound, is holding you back from apprenticeship to Jesus and the life that he has for you. And we don't have all the answers for that, and there's, we're, not, we're not therapists here, but we would love to just say yes to what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life and set you free and bring inner healing over that. If you resonate at all with that, I, this is a really safe place. Um, would you just slip your hand up? And we're just going to pray for you. We're not going to make you say your name. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to tell your story. Would you just, if you feel up for that, would you just thank you for that for, and just keep it up for a moment? We're just going to pray for you. That's all. Just keep your hand up. We're not going to take your debit card number or anything, I promise. Um, great. Just keep, I'm just going to give it five seconds. For, I know it's a little scary. I don't know what the culture is here, if you do this or not, but just give it a moment. Okay, now um, just keep it up. I want to put all of you around them. Like you're now on the prayer team for Formatio, okay? So I just want to have you, if you follow Jesus and you breathe oxygen, I'd love to have you pray. So maybe half a dozen or so around each hand up. If you know, just look around you, see if there's anybody around you, make sure nobody is missed. Would you just go to them and if it's appropriate, place a hand on a shoulder. And if you want to get a name, that's it. You don't need to have an interview or journalistic nothing. Just maybe a name. And then we'll just wait on God. Would you just wait for a moment and see if God brings a word or a phrase or a scripture or something plays in your mind? And then in humility, would you just offer that to them in love and prayer? And if nothing comes to your mind, would you just pray a short prayer 
a blessing and healing of God over them. And let's just pray for these. So go ahead, circle up. There should be about a quick name thing, about 20 seconds of just quiet as people wait on God, and then just begin to pray. You don't need to whisper, pray as loud as you want. Please make sure nobody is lost. If you put your hand up and people aren't around you, just slip it back up again, and we'll make sure we come around you. Again, we're not in a rush. The many inconvenience for the few. Spirit, we just pray that even now, as these names are spoken out loud, that they would come before you and that you'd begin to offer truth and spirit and healing. 